Hello and welcome to Design Education Talks, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and Design the Ducks Potter. Our guest today is Natalia Delgado. Welcome, Natalia. Hi, thank you for having me here. Oh, thank you for coming. Tell us a bit about you and your work. Uh, I am a graphic designer, uh, originally from Mexico, now living in Montreal, Canada. Oh, fantastic. I've been practicing for about 15-ish, 15 plus years. I graduated uh, from graphic design program in 2001. Um, but I've been studying for a while because I did my, my master's as well. And then I did a PhD on art education. And uh, I've been teaching also since really, um, since graduating pretty much uh, graphic design for different universities in uh, Mexico and Canada. And currently I am teaching at uh, Vanier College in Montreal. Great, that's fantastic. So that's, 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 a, that's a quite a journey. Uh, uh, how, how have you found uh, that, that journey? It's been really, it's been really fun and really challenging at times and really interesting. Mm. And I think it has um, helped build my vision of design. Mm. Um, I've had also the opportunity to teach uh, around the world. Uh, I was a um, collaborator with Poster for Tomorrow for many years, so I also got to go uh, to teach in um, Africa and uh, in South America and so on. And yeah, I've been in, in Europe as well. So this has really given me the chance to uh, observe design and design education in different parts of the world. And also, I think even now living in Montreal, one of my favorite things about the city is that it's so multicultural. Uh, Montreal is a melting pot of, of culture. So even in my classroom, even though it's in like Canada, I have students from all sorts of different uh, cultural backgrounds as well. That's wonderful. That that's actually makes teaching very interesting uh, when different cultures are mixing. Never, yes. And when the, because you get all these different uh, uh, results, and also that the students are are seeing how how each each of uh, the, the, the co co colleagues is dealing with, with solutions. Yes. So uh, fantastic. So tell us what is your current sort of research or work or visual work or uh, some things like that. Uh, I just finished writing, this will be my first uh, book. Uh, I am co-authoring with uh, Professor Scott Lazaro uh, from Temple, Temple University in the US. And we wrote this book called Making Posters from Concept to Design. And we've been working about it for like the past two years and it's due to be published on September 3rd uh, this year, hopefully. We'll, uh, you know, things are shifting a little bit with uh, COVID, but hopefully yeah. it comes out in September. And yeah, it took, it took, it, it gathers a lot of like our experience and we also did a lot of research for it, uh, trying to just like, I have a, a long um, trajectory of creating posters. And, um, and the book was really interesting because we went from like, like the title says from the concept. So talking about different ways of conceptualization. And that applies not only for posters, but for all of design, because it's this idea of coming up with ideas, you know, and, and tackling uh, challenges and problem solving and uh, uh, dealing with uh, writer's luck or in this case, designer's luck and so on. And then it, as, as it evolves to the book, the, the second part is more about um, the actual um, image making. So we look into different techniques and we got wonderful examples from designers from all over the world that share with us their posters. So we look at all these different techniques and, and graphic ways to approach it. And then uh, as, as the book pro moves on from the next chapters, we go into like more of the persuasion and storytelling aspects of um, the um, graphic design. And finally, we, uh, we end with a chapter that's uh, sort of like the future of the poster. Uh, where we're looking at how it's evolving and, and how it's staying relevant <laughs> in a, in the, when we're almost going paperless in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so we look at all the different ways that posters are incorporating sound, touch, smell, taste, like all the, all the senses, and also uh, animation and uh, um, becoming these sort of like um, animated posters or these little um, 
the different animation styles and some of them having sound, some of them having movement, uh, three dimensionality and so on. So that's that's been really uh, cool. And that's pretty much what I've been involved with for the past, uh, like I say, a year and a half, almost two years uh, that to, to, to have it come to fruition. Sounds great. What is the title of the book? Uh, making posters from concept to design. Wonderful. So the future of the poster is interactive. In, in many ways, yes. It's, uh, it's very interesting the way that it's evolving now because um, it's, it, once you become, once you get into the interactive, um, what used to be a bidimensional static object, now all of a sudden you had, you had sound, you had movement. So the rules change completely, you know, and you might be really good at doing the static design but you might be making like really boring animated posters because you just don't understand like if you haven't had experience or training in that area. Uh, it's a completely different challenge, you know, you have to think about timing and musicalization. And uh, so it becomes more like uh, connected to cinematography in a way um, as, as it is evol evolving. And even now you can see some of the big studios will have animated posters of their uh, of their movies, like there was like Finding Nemo that you had an animated poster and, they, and you can find them on YouTube and different, different places. But again, it becomes a completely different um, narrative. Um, but, but not only animation, there's also, like I say, all these elements of um, incorporating the senses. So we found really, really fascinating examples from around the world. And actually in the UK, we found one where they were using it for the subway, uh, um, posters and they were a coke a coke example where they were using cinnamon smell to promote their new flavor so you actually smell it so it's very interesting how it's sort of blending you know the the what used to be the borders i guess of design and it's not just a old poster and nothing else but it's like they're all inter intertwining and going back to the cultural idea it's the same thing right like it's becoming more enmeshed and less uh divided or fragmented into untouchable areas. Mm -hmm. So that was really interesting to do for the book as well. Yeah, fantastic. It's, it's really exciting. Uh, keep, us, keep us posted on the... Yes, <laughs> for sure. Tell us about your teaching journey. How did you get into teaching? So I was really, really young when I started teaching. I was like straight out of university. I was 23 and uh, it was... Um, sort of like a fluke, like I've never thought of teaching in my life. And um, I, uh, my boyfriend at the time, he was, um, he was gonna start teaching at a university and then he got a different job. So he, uh, he mentioned it to me and I kind of went and interviewed for it, but I didn't really uh, know anything about teaching except my own experience as a student. And I, it's, it's really funny thinking about it now because I used to be growing up really shy about speaking in public or being in front of an audience of any kind. So I, I really dreaded it. So at first I was like really hesitant <laughs> to, to, uh, to be in front of a group for that. And I still remember my first class, I was like, like sweating before and super nervous. But then once I actually did the class, I really, I was like, oh, I really like this. And I, uh, I really enjoyed the, the process. And when I first started, I really liked the challenge of it. And I really liked that I would have to like really learn stuff. So if it was almost like if I wanted to learn something, I would get a class teaching it because I knew that I had to like really study it. And in order to prepare a lesson, you have to like really grasp what's happening beyond a, a superficial level. So for me, that was really, really um, fascinating. And that's kind of like what led me to my academic path afterwards. So once I went to my master's and my PhD, they were more focused towards the um, education side. The master's a little bit more, still more like theory research. And then the PhD was like education uh, itself. So I was like really looking for, uh, okay, how can I get like better and really like really good at, at this area that I'm liking. And, um, and I think because I had such good experiences um, as a student and some bad experiences as a student with some of my teachers, uh, for me, it was like, how can I be the teacher that I would have liked to have when I was studying? And um, 
so it it evolved to become um, my sort of like my main profession, but um, but it started really <laughs> really like uh, by accident, I would say. Yeah. So what what was the title of your PhD? It's a PhD in uh, art education. Mm -hmm. And the the research your particular research was. Now, so for my PhD, I did a, a collaborative, uh, so the research was on co-design. Mm -hmm. So I, I uh, studied this idea of, of collaborative design. And I work with a group uh, in Vancouver uh, called the Green Street Game. And which was, it was a really interesting project because we were doing research. So like meta co-design because the, the, the group itself, the Green Street Games, created a collaborative design game mm -hmm. for community engagement. Mm -hmm. And my research was like co-creating the game uh, with them. So it was like co-creating a game for co-creation. And, uh, and I studied like the two levels of, of co-creation, how would the, the people who were using the game were collaborating to, to, you know, to play the game. And then I analyzed our own collaborative uh, experience to create the game. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it was it was really um, really interesting to to see the um, the project evolve because uh, when I when we did it it was out of like it was like out of their interest the, the the people who were doing it they were doing it out of their love and interest for collaboration and community engagement but as the project evolved it actually became a tool like we, it was used by the city of Vancouver for one of their projects so. It was very uh, fascinating to see sort of going from like a school project or like a, a, a fun little thing to like something that actually has to be used, actually has to be uh, applied. And even like the, uh, there's um, financial aspects and all these sort of uh, elements. And um, so that's what I did for my, for my uh, PhD uh, research. So you've talked all over the world. Tell us, tell us about the best bits or the, the or the challenges uh, <laughs> about the different places or what you find different. So I, even from I, I I start always saying that it, for me it's always been interesting every time I go to like a new place. So I studied in public university in Mexico City. So it's like really competitive. You have to do uh, there's like twenty thousand applicants and only like I think like forty get in or something. So it's like extremely competitive and the teachers all the time are saying like well if you don't like it <laughs> you're free to, you're free to walk out plenty of people here want your place and um and then when i started teaching i started teaching at a private university in a small town so it was like almost the, the opposite uh, approach and there's a lot more like one-on-one -on -one, a lot of attention and, and so on and uh and every place i go it's been different again so when I went to uh, Africa for the first time, uh, they actually uh, brought, I was, I was teaching a poster workshop and they brought 150 students for the workshop. Because <laughs> well, it was like, oh, it's, yeah, we're having, we're having a foreign teacher come for the workshop. Uh, why not? And again, like I think anyone else would have been like, no, this can't happen. But me, me being the Mexican, I was like, no, yeah, absolutely, we can make it happen. So I split it into two 75 student groups and I taught the same workshop like morning and evening. So I did two workshops actually instead of one. But, uh, and, and we didn't have like some, one of the students had to bring a generator uh, to have light so that we could do the workshop. And there was like all these sort of like uh, logistical uh, uh, nightmares. But, uh, but like a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of enthusiasm, like really friendly, really uh, loving, and uh, and at the same time not used to the uh, super intense uh, work <laughs> methodology. So being like, oh, Natalia, we're tired, <laughs> and uh, and so on, and uh, and then so so every time I go to a, a, a new place, I see this this uh, this differences in the way that the, that the things that things are run. Uh, but at the same time, I see that uh, in terms of design itself, the questions from the students are exactly the same any, everywhere. So it's like the client doesn't understand me and wants to change, you know, my, my, the colors of my design or 
I can't come up with more than one idea, you know, and I get stuck and then, or I cannot finish the project, you know, and I lose motivation, like very similar. And I think that's so fascinating, like, you know, as a shared human experience in this case, because uh, a lot of those questions are not about design per se, but, but they're like questions about human relationships, right? This is like, oh, I'm communicating with another human being here, but this is not working out or I'm not feeling motivated. That's emotional, right? That's, there's obviously design to, like strategies for that, but it really comes down to more of like the psychology and uh, all these social elements of the relationships. And that for me has been like really enlightening in, in my practice, because then I'm like, oh, this is like something that is so um, key to our profession that it's being replicated everywhere right so it doesn't matter if it's an, an, an africa and we don't have lights and we don't have computers or if it's you know in europe and we have like the fanciest classroom the the, the client not getting me it's happening everywhere in, in the world and uh, and i guess if you go to like you know facebook or whatever you can see that as well you can see like the, the very common threads that uh repeat uh, so on so i think for me that was really fascinating and um I think more and more as we become uh, globalized, the, the differences um, get reduced a little bit in terms of uh, the way we work, you know, and, and like almost like everybody now is some sort of like similar software, similar. And so it might be budgetary uh, restraints, but we're all sort of working in similar uh, ways. Um, and so it's more about the design philosophies that we are teaching with that might be uh, different. Uh, but I think the students are very similar uh, all over the world. That's that's the one thing that I have found that it's very very um, very constant that they, that you have this this these students and um, even like Canada, Mexico, Africa. I can tell you like all these different places that I've been to. I've been to Ecuador and so on. And, and the questions I can I can already uh, uh, anticipate the questions that I'm going to have because of this shared human experience. That's, that's fantastic. And how has the, your, your international experience enhanced your teaching? Pardon? How has your international experience enhanced your teaching? I think it's, um, the, I think the students really like when you um, have a different background, like they, they are interested to know and uh, it's, it's um, sometimes in, uh, I found it even here in Canada that uh, like I'm the only, in my, in my, in my work, I'm the only uh, Latino, like Latino woman that's teaching. So for them, that's like, that's been like a new experience, you know, so they get to learn a different uh, style of yeah. doing, yeah. of doing things and of seeing the world. Yeah. And uh, they really like, when they when I show them examples from uh, uh, different parts of the world, and again, even when I'm telling you about this shared experience, they're like, "Oh, this happens in Mexico too." I thought I thought this was just me. So uh, that for that for them that's uh, an enlightening. Mm -hmm. And also, I like to bring a lot of my um, connections to to the classroom. So I often do I'll do like Skype calls or um, Zoom meetings now and uh, with with people from different parts of the world. So for like, for example, last year for my class, uh, I brought uh, Ram Castillo from Australia and he was just like connecting with us via Skype and talking about his experience. And so that's, I think, very enriching um, for them. And uh, just seeing different ways of doing things. I think when we are very limited to what's happening in my neighborhood or my, um, you know, my, my city, I, I can think that this is the only way things can be done, right? And I like the story of the, of the monks and the cat. I don't know if you've heard it, but of the, of the, the they have a cat. The, the, this is a monastery and they have a cat. And so the cat's always like interrupting the meditation. So they're like, no, we have to like tie the cat while, while, while the meditation is happening and then we release him um, so we can meditate in peace. So they do that and it's successful. So they, you know, like they keep doing it for generations and generations. 
And then after a while, it's uh, nobody knows what they're doing it anymore. And uh, so there's a point where it's like, oh, we need to put the, the cat, you know, the cat dies. And there's like, oh, we need to find a new cat so we can, so we can tie the cat so we can do the meditation. Uh, it, so, it's, so it becomes uh, uh, unquestionable anymore. Sure. And you don't even know what you're doing. And if you look at um, history, there's all kinds of uh, interesting things like that. I think someone was telling me about the way, like the way the highways are done is something about the way you had to do the cart with the horses. And that was the, the width of the, I think it's the train tracks. I, I don't remember the exact example, but it's all these things that become just like unquestionable. So when someone comes from outside, bringing a different perspective, all of a sudden you're like, well, can this be done? And in my own experience, I like to tell the story of how I got started into poster design because poster design was like really what opened the world for me. And when I was doing poster design, I was living in a small town where there was no poster design culture. There was a uh, tabloid was the biggest poster that would be printed. There were no clients that wanted poster design. You know, it was, it was just like, I, I love poster design and I was in the worst place for it. And by, by having, Luckily, living in a time where I could go online and finding like all this, I, Europe was like the, the contests were happening in, a lot in Europe back then. I remember it was a good 50 by 70 contest. So by having that, I was just like able to connect with a completely different world and actually build a network uh, around it. And then that led me, you know, to getting friendships and getting uh, connecting with Poster for Tomorrow and all this, everything that, that happened afterwards was because I was able to have a different perspective. Had I only had my city, I would have quit poster design because there was nothing to do there. Mm. So I think that for the students has been really cool when you're like uh, able to connect. And of course with social media, a lot of them are doing it already. But when you're able to maybe in the design world, show them, oh, you know, this thing that you like, there's someone somewhere else in the world that's doing really interesting stuff uh, regarding what you are doing, you know, and even in history, you know, oh, yeah, there's like, you know what, ha that happened in, in, in Asia, you know, like 50 years ago, and, and you should read this, you should look into that, that I think it's really, um, really fun for them and really um, gives them a sense of um, companionship in, in a lot of their passions and a lot of their interests. Brilliant, brilliant. So in, in your experiences, uh, is there anything in design education that you'd like to do differently, that you'd like to change or improve? Uh... I think, uh, obviously, like I say, it depends on, on, on every institution. Um, overall, I think there's a certain, still a certain, um, can I say, putting a really high the technology and a lot of emphasis on, on teaching software. Mm -hmm. And I'm concerned about that due, because I, I believe that the, in the future, really what's gonna be the, strong, the strength of design is gonna be the conceptualization and the in, more intellectual deep operations mm -hmm. uh, is what, what's really gonna, you know, like the remaining designers, so to speak, because the machines are evolving more mm -hmm. and more and the machines are replacing us. And we can, you know, complain about it or be angry, but it's a reality and it's, they've done it with other jobs mm -hmm. and they're going to do it with the design. And you can see, I always like to use my mom as an example, because my mom is super like self-started <laughs> do it yourself kind of person. So she downloads all the, you know, all the apps and all the, uh, all the uh, things that can, that, where she can design. And she's actually built her own website and she's done all this uh, and pretty good, sometimes <laughs> better than a lot of designers. And so you can see that there's already all this software that's automa uh, making automatic decisions for you and uh, like logo makers and all these things. And of course, at this moment there, you can still say like, oh, they're really basic or whatever, but these algorithms are learning really fast and they are, uh, you know, there's a lot of people working in that. So realistically, I think uh, this, there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna be replaced um, and that's gonna take a lot of designer jobs. If you look even now at the, if you look 50 years ago, the designers, they had like the whole control of everything, you know, because everything was done by hand. Nobody could do all these things. You know, you had all these skills that no one had access to. 
even when I was studying, we were still doing like, you know, the cutting and, and all these things. And then just like, even in, my, in the short period of, of uh, a couple of like 20, 30 years, all of that is gone, right? Now it's everybody has their computer. All of this is becoming more and more automatic. You've cut a lot of middle positions. So for me, that would be the change that I would do. I think, I, I think there's a lot of emphasis on teaching software and, um, and maybe not enough emphasis on teaching critical thinking, on teaching um, conceptualization, uh, uh, creative development, uh, psychology, uh, human relationships. And I think those will be the strengths of design um, moving forward. And uh, <laughs> it looks like you want to say something. And uh, the, 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 this idea of, um, I lost my train of thought, but it's this human relationships is what's gonna, I think what's gonna keep uh, like really make design stand. And sometimes we get attached to things because we like them. So I, 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 I know like even me, it would, it would be like, oh, but the papers, you know, or certain things that have like an emotional connection because they're beautiful and, and we love them. But, but we're not thinking maybe strategically about uh, the, how are we gonna build the profession towards the future and uh, in the reality of uh, developing AI development and uh, globalization and all these different, um, all these different elements. So I think that would be my, my, uh, my main suggestion for, for teaching. And also the inter, interdiscipline, I think more and more we're doing it, but still very, still very hard for us. And that was why I was interested in co-design because collaboration, we're, we struggle a lot. And uh, I, uh, coming from a Mexican culture, Mexicans, we are great in families, but we're really bad at teamwork. And, uh, and uh, Canadians are much better at teamwork than Mexicans are. And I think some cultures are more uh, better at collaborating. But still, even in the classroom, whenever I do like a team assignment, it's like, oh, let's all split our parts and come assemble this at the last minute to, to, to present. So there's not a lot of knowledge of how we can effectively um, collaborate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that should be key as well in, the, in education, is teaching. How all these things about human interaction, how to work with other colleagues, how to work with clients, how to uh, you know understand complex uh, projects. And uh, I'm not saying that this isn't being done at all, but I think it should be emphasized even more. Mm. Brilliant, brilliant. Where is the place of craft in all this? Because, for example, Paul Rand said that what distinguishes us from a cow is using our hands. So, and you, since you mentioned the AI example. What, what the AI seems not to be able to do is uh, craft, is sort of something that's very much analog. Mm -hmm. Where do you see all those skills coming into the new design education system? But by craft, do you mean uh, the, uh, well, like, can you specify just the craft? Uh, 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 hmm? Printmaking, screen printing, drawing, painting. Okay, all, yeah, all the traditional, <laughs> traditional <laughs> techniques. Not require technology. Uh, yeah. like digital, te digital technology. I think there's there's a little place for for that. Uh, it's I mean I can't predict the future, but I can tell based on what I'm seeing that it would become delegated more to like an artistic practice, which I've seen happen. Uh, I I know like some in photography, like let's say everything's digital now, but there's still people who are doing you know like the dark room. It's not really practical for the marketplace. <laughs> You're not going to get, you know, your picture in the New York Times and, and, and go develop it on the um, dark room and do things like that. But I know a lot of people like to do it as artistic practice, as an, as an artistic approach. So I think that would be uh, one of the things that it's happening. And um, other than that, I, I don't see it. I, I think some of it in education, it helps to understand concepts. So like, let's say screen printing, yeah, I know like a lot of programs have it and uh, I hated it when I was studying because I, I hated all the spells. But, uh, but it's, it's really useful in terms of understanding like the color separation and how, every, how everything uh, works. Um, but I, think, I do think that it's going to become less and less um, 
prominent in, in, in education. And uh, I was fascinated by the, um, I don't know if you saw the Nutella packaging a couple of years ago that was designed by the algorithm. And uh, so this was like a Nutella special edition and the, the AI just created like a different, ta a different packaging for each Nutella uh, jar based, based on its algorithm. And some of them were beautiful. Like they were like all these color combinations and, uh, and it sold out because people loved it so much. It was like success for, for Nutella. And uh, so, and, then that, and that, was, that wasn't even like, oh, we're doing the same design. Like the, the computer actually created like a million different designs. And that for me was like, okay, we need, like, we really need to, as, as designers, pay attention to this, you know, because it's, um, it's um, like almost like a warning from the future, like, okay, if this is what it can do now, and, and you've seen how fast these machines can learn, then it's just a matter of time. And I'm not saying time like a hundred years, I'm saying like two years, you know, five years, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And uh, I always remember this episode of The Simpsons. I don't know if you saw it, where they're like at a radio station and they bring this machine that's doing the radio show. And the, and the hosts are like, oh, that's so wonderful. And then the other one is like, no, don't, <laughs> don't, don't praise the machine that can replace your, your job. Uh, so I think in, in, it's the same thing. And unfortunately, in the, one of the problems of um, education is that we're always a little bit behind because of the way that institutions work and the bureaucracy and so on we're always a little bit behind of the curve right if you i always say if you want to do groundbreaking research you usually don't do it in universities anymore you go to work for a private company you know and that's what they're doing and i have friends who are in the private industry and they're doing amazing research like whoa like way ahead of anything that i've seen in in my academic uh, colleagues so I definitely think that that's uh, something that we really need to be mindful of. And that's what I was saying, because you can really have like an emotional attachment to uh, a certain practice, but that doesn't mean that it's gonna, uh, that just because you, you, because you feel attached to it, it doesn't mean that it's still relevant to be taught. Mm -hmm. So, and my best example would be, uh, I, I love to make things by hand. So if you look at my poster work, a lot of it, it's made by hand and I still force my students to do stuff by hand. I'll ask you the question. Yeah, and, and, and I love it. And I, I work better touching stuff, like I'm super tactile. And I think there's a, like element, and even like I was saying, the posters that are using touch, like there's, there's an element of touch. And, uh, and I think this COVID situation has put that to the test because we're doing all this Zoom and all this virtual communication and you're seeing like the parts that work and the parts that lack, where you're like, no, I need to be face to face. I need to have human interaction. And I think it's it's sort of making us question both ways because I think a lot of things that we thought could not be done online, we're realizing they can. And a lot of things that we're like, oh, it's for sure that like we do not need <laughs> the human body anymore. We are realizing we do, you know. So uh, I think that's important lessons that can be learned from um, from both. And um, I, I'm just. Just jumping a little bit off the topic, uh, but still into the topic, I, I was talking about this uh, with some friends uh, based to a Facebook post, because uh, a friend of mine was complaining about um, on online teaching, because a lot everyone's being uh, forced to, to, to teach online now for, for the fall, and most of the, uh, I don't know, uh, on, on that on your side, but here in, in, in North America, it's like pretty much every university is going to be teaching online for the fall. And, and that's just sort of like a decision that was made. And some courses are very easily adaptable. And some courses you're like, what am I gonna do with like silk screen printing uh, uh, <laughs> online? You know? So I think, um, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I think we definitely need to be um, leaning more towards this and really finding the ways because I do believe that's the way the world is is going, you know. And um, well, I'm I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure that this is the world, the way the world is going. So uh, I think uh, as educators, it's our uh, and because we're forming the next generations, we really have to be thinking of what their future is going to be like, and not necessarily like what I like or what or you know what I what I what I learn what I like, but more like what are they going to need 
what kind of world are they going to be living in and, and are, is what I'm teaching them relevant for them? Like, am I preparing them to be uh, like, to, to be like, to thrive in this future for them? So that really re requires us to completely shift from like the past, which is what I learned and not even the present, which is what I'm doing right now, but like really sort of like try to predict what's happening. And uh, the only way to do that is by like, like observing what's going on in the world around you and try to make like the most educated guesses and try to bring the best for them to prepare them for uh, the future to come. Brilliant. Brilliant. How can our viewers and listeners find you? Uh, I have my website. It's currently under redevelopment, but it should be good by the end of the summer. It's not, not my name, nataliadelgado.com. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram as uh, Natalia Delgado Design and on Facebook, uh, Natalia Delgado Avila, which is my second last name. And um, I'm, I love to connect. I'm, I'm always, uh, that's how we met. <laughs> I love to connect uh, on, on uh, social media. And if you want to, you know, like discuss or share or collaborate, I'm always uh, super happy to meet new people. Brilliant. Any, any last advice you'd like to leave us with? Mm, um, I would say that for me, the most important thing is to be really connected with your, um, with your heart in the practice. I find that uh, I, I, I often talk about um, passion this is one of my, my conferences that I get invited to talk a lot about and sort of like finding your your passions and uh, when I was interviewing for different jobs I found that a lot uh, a question that emerged a lot from the uh, from other professors or people who were interviewing me was about motivation and they were like talking about students being unmotivated and students being like depressed and students being all these things and which was interesting because it was it wasn't like again not a design specific question Yes. but something that we deal with every day. So I always try to, first of all, preach from example. So I always try to be aligned. And uh, that's why I've always kept professional practice parallel to my uh, academic practice, even though sometimes I need like 72 days, <laughs> 22 hour days instead of 24 to do everything. But I find that it fuels me, like my creative practice fuels my education. My education fuels my creative practice. So it doesn't feel draining and exhausting. And I always tell the students, you're not going to feel happy uh, every day. You're not going to be like, yay, but you should enjoy like 80% of the time, you know? And if you're not enjoying what you're doing, you really need to like sit down and think why that is. And I think for academics is the same, you know? It's, uh, I can, like the world of teaching is so demanding and we have so many things and meetings and so on. But again, if you find yourself that you're not like filled with joy <laughs> and, and, and like really enjoying it. We really need to like sit down and, and, and realign and think about this because I know there's like, it can be exhausting at times. And, uh, and so if you're feeling that you can connect with me, <laughs> I can give you some pointers, but that would be my, my advice to just like try to find the alignment inside and uh, to carve your own path. I think that has, for me, it's, uh, I, when I was younger, I used to compare a lot to everything around me. And, uh, and now that I've, that I've reached this point in my life, I'm like, oh, I'm Mexican. And I, and I moved to Canada and, and, and I teach in like this uh, uh, melting pot. And I, be, like, I have all this like really unique experience. And I like that because it's different. And then that can also inspire someone else because they're like, oh, she's, she's doing this. So I think not only um, to look at what's around, but to connect with your own experience and what you can bring. And I really thank you for inviting me here to share my experience because that's, uh, that's really valuable for me to be able to, uh, to see, you know, to connect with other educators around the, the world. And um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.